I don't want to. I don't want to beat a dead horse, so to speak, uh, this evening. But I, I do want to address kind of a, a pertinent issue uh, for us that that we're still living in uh, tonight, and that is the the unprecedented times. Now, I, I don't say that meaning that no one else has ever experienced um, societal issues like like you and I are. There, there's been a lot darker days in humanity's history than what we're facing. But as far as our generation is concerned. In, uh, in America, these are very unprecedented times. We are, we are living in very perplexing days. And, uh, and really, I would just like to make sure tonight that we maintain our heading as the church of Jesus Christ. None of these things move me, neither count my, I, my life dear unto myself. And that, that should be uh, the rallying cry of, of the believer. What, what happens in the political realm, in, in the economic realm, what, what happens uh, to the social structure of America has no bearing on the child of God whatsoever. Whether, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Uh, we, we should learn in whatsoever state we are in to therewith be content. Having Christ in this world, we should be content. And so I just want to kind of preach along those lines tonight, Luke chapter number 21, and we'll just read one verse of Scripture. For those of you that are more avid Bible students, you probably already recognize the fact Luke 21 is kind of that parallel passage to Matthew chapter 24. I believe there are some different components to Luke's rendition of it, uh, if you will, uh, then, uh, then the actual, what I would really refer to as the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24 uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, addressing some of the similar issues, a lot of, a lot of phrases are, are repetitive throughout both of those accounts. Luke 21 and verse number 26 tonight, Christ says, Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I want, to, I want to draw our attention to that main expression found in the first part of verse 26 where Christ says that men's hearts would be failing them. And I want to really preach on that thought of heart failure tonight. Verse 26 speaks of men's hearts failing them. This is the only time that this word uh, for failing here is actually used inside of the entire New Testament. Uh, the word itself means to breathe out or to stop breathing. As I was studying this past week, a couple of the resources that I was using to study made mention of other versions of the Bible. And it was telling me how other versions had thus translated uh, this expression, men's hearts failing them for fear. And the majority of them translated it something like this, men fainting from fear. Well, those versions are wrong tonight. <laughs> is what you would gather from that. The Bible's not talking about fainting or passing out. The Bible here is talking about men who are dying, men who are losing their life, their hearts failing them for fear. Literally, you could say these men are scared to death, scared, fearful, verse 26, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. The society that Jesus spoke about here in Luke 21 was a society that was becoming increasingly fearful for those things that were taking place or would soon take place inside of their lives. And so Jesus is addressing those particular is issues. In fact, the passage here is talking about what will happen to Jerusalem in the very near future and really that it is going to be destroyed. And we know through the privilege of hindsight in the Roman siege of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, General Titus would come in and would lay the city waste. And Israel, as we know it, would cease to be a nation up until around 1948. And so Jesus is dealing in a futuristic sense with what is going to befall the city of Jerusalem and the outlying communities. And he's, so he's laying it out and he's saying these are the things that are going to happen. And while those things are kind of setting up and as everyone is noticing the adversity and the hostility of what is taking place around them, they are going to become increasingly anxious. They are, their, their nerves are going to ramp up and, and they're really going to get to a place that it starts to cause heart conditions 
to the point of actually putting people into what we would call cardiac arrest. Uh, verse 25, the preceding verse to our text tonight, actually mentions several of the characteristics that will be taking place. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Here's two things that I really want to mention tonight specific to our message. There would be, verse 25, distress of nations. And then the Bible says, with perplexity. Those are two interesting terms. The expression distress of nations refers to severe emotional distress, overwhelming and overpowering fear, something that grips you to the core that, that really begins to severely affect the way you behave. We're not talking about closet fears here. We're, we're not talking about uh, being scared of the dark. We're, we're talking about something that, that heavily influences the way that you will live your life. And it is a distress, therefore, of nations. And then the second term, verse 25, is with perplexity. These things are taking place with perplexity, the Bible says. Perplexity being at a loss. Uncertainty. The idea is that there is this severe emotional distress over uncertainties. Uh, people are literally freaking out over something they're not even sure about. There's the looming threat, and they don't know exactly what's going to take place. What is going to take place hasn't taken place yet. It's just the fear of the unknown causing this unnecessary stress, literally causing men to go into heart failure. These are, for that particular generation, unprecedented times. Had that taken place before in Judaico history? Absolutely. But this generation, it was something very new for them. Now say to us tonight in 2021 that we are living in very similar days. Not in days of heightened threat for our city or even our, our state or nation to be destroyed. But we are living in days of perplexity, days of uncertainty, fear of those things which are coming. Did you notice that in verse 26? These aren't things that have happened. These are the looming threat of things that may happen. And we know that there were certain things that were going to happen. But the majority, the population at large, did not understand what was going to take place. And so it's just a fear. They see certain things happening and they are increasingly, overwhelmingly fearful. And so we live in very similar days where, where we are constantly through the news media and other outlets being informed of, uh, of threat after threat after threat after threat and, uh, and really just having things almost literally crammed down our throats that we are supposed to believe not just about a virus but about racial tensions, about politics, about economics, you name it. We are facing things all the time. If you are one of those individuals that loves talk radio and news broadcasts and stuff like that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're taking two or three Xanaxes a day because that's all it, it, it Listen, listen, bad news sales. You ever notice that? F folks, when they give the weather report, they don't say there's a 90% chance of sunshine. They say there's a 10% chance of rain. And so everything is kind of given with a negative slant. Let's, let's, let's make things a little bit more personal for us in this setting. Back in June of 2020, the CDC reported that over 25 million Americans seriously considered suicide. Over 25 million at the near halfway point of last year. What do you think those statistics will be by the time you got around, around uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and folks not necessarily being able to celebrate the holidays like they are accustomed to. Over 25 million Americans seriously considering suicide. And really, every, every known category of people, there was a, a heightened average of those committing suicide. Uh, among genders, there were more males, more females. Among ethnic groups, there were more Latinos, more African Americans, more, more Caucasians. Uh, it, it was literally up almost literally a, across the whole entire board. Uh, folks, um, folks really seeing everything that was unfolding before their eyes, a constant threat and a promise of threats inside of their life, and folks start seriously contemplating taking their own life. What's taking place then? Even inside of American civilization, I'll answer that question for you tonight 
men's hearts failing them for fear of those things coming on the earth. Just a fear. A fear of what may take place. A fear of something that may happen. In, uh, in connection with uh, COVID-19, it's the fear that I may contract a virus. A virus that has already been known enough to be located on the back label of your can of Lysol that it is actually already designed to kill a coronavirus. Things that are not necessarily that new, things are not necessarily that blown up out of proportion, yet, however, we are constantly threatened with the onslaught of, uh, you know, so many millions of people potentially are going to lose their lives all because of a singular virus. I'm not going to deal with that at length tonight. We've dealt with that probably enough here in the last several months. Just to make one more notation for you, there's no increase at all in the death toll from 2019 to 2018. None at all. In fact, 2018 and 2019, the death rate was actually down from 2017 inside of America. The same statistic stands. 10 out of 10 people die. We're going to die of something eventually. It is appointed unto men once to die. But we live in that generation where men's hearts are failing them because there is a fear of what may take place. In Luke 21, the believing Jews were not left without certain instruction. The Word of God told them how they were to behave in light of those things seemingly coming on the earth. And here's the thing, fear was not part of the equation. Believing the believing remnant of Jews were not to be fearful about those things that were taking place. God had previously told them what things were going to happen. They were to be expecting those things to take place. And God had told them specifically what they were to do in light of those things coming to pass. 2,000 years later, in Western civilization, the Bible has not left you and I without instructions either. The Bible speaks to us informing us how we are to behave ourselves in times of fearfulness. Here's a a couple of messages the Bible speaks into our life. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A rational, logical mind to think for ourselves and not let the mainstream media think for us, whether that's CNN or Fox News, who really gives a rip about which location it really comes from. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10, Fear thou not. Why? For I am with thee, God says. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. He's sufficient for us, right? Uh, 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 If God be for us, who can be against us? God's the majority, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, I love this one. Jesus said, verse number 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but cannot or are not able to kill the soul. Now, last, last I figured, the COVID virus may be bad. I'm not, I'm not sure. I've got folks around me that have been sick, and it's like, uh, it's like other viruses, and it affects people maybe differently than it affects others. But the last I, I heard, it was not able to kill the soul. Racial tensions are at an all-time high. We had some episodes take place uh, inside of our uh, membership this past week. And racial tensions are, are, are increasingly at a, at, a, at a very high place. But last I, I figured, no, uh, no domestic violence can kill your soul. Um, there's a fear of economics. A uh, liberal agenda would have us to, um, to move uh, towards a socialistic economy where everybody is on equal playing terms, which means that you can be a high school dropout and work at McDonald's flipping cheeseburgers the rest of your life and make twice as much as you did last year this time. Because everybody deserves the same. Not sure where they got that from, uh, but, uh, but that's not right. <laughs> Uh, every, everybody, in fact, here's what the Bible says. Those that don't work shouldn't eat. And a man that wouldn't take care of his own household is worse than an infidel. Right? That's not, uh, that's not, uh, that's not right. It's, um, but no matter how bad it gets economically, uh, poverty never can kill the soul. 
Economics can't kill the soul. Politics can't kill the soul. Why are we as professing believers falling into this snare of constant fear? There should be no fear. Uh, we're not talking about living in some uh, superficial euphoric state where, where, where we live above reality. Listen, uh, 10 years ago if you got the virus, I didn't want to shake your hand. <laughs> you know, if you, got a, if you got the flu bug, Five years ago, I didn't want you to come to church because I didn't want to get it, all right? Uh, it's, that's just, that, that's what we call common sense, which happens to be not so common any longer. But what about specifics? How are we specifically supposed to live in, in days of increasing uh, fearfulness? Well, what does the Bible address those kinds of subjects? Well, I, I believe it does tonight. Uh, so what specific instruction does the Bible give to us during, during perplexing times? Let me give to you three such encouragements from the Word of God tonight. What we are to do in fear is gripping the heart of our nation. Number one, if you're taking notes, you jot it down. We ought to be at peace. We are to be at peace. Take your Bibles with me. Leave Luke 21. And let's go over to the first epistle of Peter, chapter number 3. First Peter, chapter number 3. In verse number 15, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you, or that is in you, with meekness and fear. Remember that, uh, that Peter is writing to individuals that are facing uh, extreme affliction inside of their life. These are people that are being persecuted uh, for their faith. There is the national hostility surrounding, uh, um, surrounding Israel, uh, the, the pervading onslaught of, of, just, uh, of just natural adversities. But, but then there's the heightened awareness of such adversity because these individuals had named the name of Christ and they were being severely persecuted. They were, they were in desperate times of afflictions inside their life. And so it's interesting with that kind of backdrop on it that Peter would write, verse number 15, and he would say for us to sanctify, for those individuals to sanctify their, uh, the Lord God in their hearts and to be ready to give an answer to every man that asked them a reason of the hope that was in them. And mark it down, the word hope tonight simply means an expectation or confidence. That's a good Bible term uh, when the Bible uses the word hope, it's not talking about a hope so as in I'm not sure, but I am hoping that this will happen. The term hope inside of the Bible so often uh, uh, denotes an expectancy, an assurance, and a confidence. Faith is not a hope so. Faith is, the, uh, is, is, a, is a hope, a, a confidence, and a assurance. Faith is a substance of things that we are already confident of, already assured, or already expecting uh, to take place for us. And so Peter says... While you are living in days of uncertainty, in perplexing days when you do not know what is going to happen to you uh, on the next day of the week, Peter says you are still called to live in such a way that as society at large looks at you, they see something different about the way you are living. You live, I think Peter's idea is this, you are living with a calm resolve. You are living with a steady peace about you. You are not moved by what is happening in your society. You are not moved by the threat of afflictions inside of your life. And he says, when society at large sees you living with such peace, they are going to be curious how you can live above the realm of fear. Above the realm of fear, hope expectancy, confidence. Here's the reality for us tonight, church. We can live with hope. We can live with hope. What do you mean, preacher? We can live with expectancy or confidence. Here, here's, here's, here's the truth for us this evening. God, in His Word, has told us, just as He told those believing Jews in uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, uh, God, in His precious Word, has told us what to express, uh, expect as days continue to progress. Here's, here's one of those notions. Matthew 24, verse, 20, uh, verse number 7. Christ says, For nation shall rise against nation. 
and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Wars and rumors of wars. There is uh, national unrest. There is civil unrest. Remember, uh, Jesus said, not, not only uh, have you got to worry about nation rising up against nation, but you've got to worry about uh, uh, that, that, that a man's foes would be those in his own household. That there would come a time that, that a wife would deliver up her husband. That, a, that, a, that parents would uh, deliver up their children and children their parents. And, and so families were going to get to a place where they were literally fighting against each other. Fighting because someone inside of a Jewish home would profess faith in Christ. And professing faith in Christ, which would have been illegal during that time, other family members would go rat them out and, uh, and, and, and have them excommunicated from that particular society. And so uh, there was a lot of unrest that was going to be taking place, kingdom against kingdom. And there would be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew 24 is specifically dealing with end time futuristic events. Those things again are going to be on an uprise. There's going to be a lot of national, global unrest, but there's also going to be a lot of civil unrest. Now, there's a very interesting word that you probably already made note of there in Matthew 24 verse 7. Uh, Jesus says that there was going to be pestilences. That's a hard word. You couldn't say that probably 12 times fast, amen. Uh, but it is a very, very simple word. It's the word for diseases. And Jesus says as the days continue to progress, there are going to be accompanying diseases as time continues to march on. Jesus has already told us these things are going to happen. In, in fact, as believers, we're not even looking for things to get better. <laughs> And that's not a pessimistic outlook, that's a, that's a realistic outlook. We're not expecting things to continue to get better. Uh, Paul said that evil men and seducers are going to do what? They're going to they're wax worse. There's going to, you know, times are going to become increasingly perilous. That's not a hocus pocus term. The word perilous means dangerous, right? Uh, times are just going to get increasingly more and more and more dangerous. Why is the professing church of Jesus Christ becoming alarmed by these things? We have a book that has stood the test of almost 2,000 years that is telling us these things. And yet God's people are constantly destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. A knowledge that God has inspired and preserved to this generation and forevermore. A, a, a text that not one jot or one tittle would pass away until all things were fulfilled. And yet we are living like God has not informed us of these things. Listen, we should be the most peaceful people on planet earth. Not, not because uh, of wars and rumors of wars. Not, not because of famines and earthquakes and pestilences, diseases. Uh, we should be the most pe peaceful people on planet earth because we read the last chapter. <laughs> and we know what happens to us when this thing is all over with. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse number 28, Do not fear him who can destroy your body, who can kill the body. You want to know why? Because the person that kills the body can't kill your soul. They are doing you a favor. They are giving you a speedway ticket straight into the very presence of God. The Bible says, it still says, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does this society threaten us with? What are, they, what are they threatening the child of God with? What, is a, what does a virus threaten us with? What, a, what does social tensions threaten us with? It threatens us with being ushered into the presence of God. And so Peter says that we are to live in a way that draws the attention of others. We are to have a confidence or a peace about us as we live in a turmoiled society. Live so others notice a distinction about you. We are to be at peace. Secondly, tonight, we are to be preachers. <laughs> we are to be preachers. Did you know that? That uh, everyone here tonight is called to be a preacher. Not a, not a public preacher in the sense that every man and woman, <laughs> not every man and woman, not any women, called to uh, stand behind a pulpit and pastor a church. <laughs> I hope you caught that, amen. Us men will stand on the maternity ward, but the ladies will stand on the pulpit. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Dr. Ronnie Simpson said he never had seen a pulpit big enough for a petticoat. Say amen right there. And, uh, and so, uh, and so but, but, but listen, not, not everybody's called, not all men are called 
to stand behind a, a public platform and, and preach uh, the message of Christ in this way. But we're all called to be evangels. We're, we're all called to be ministers uh, the same one to another the, uh, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We're all called to preach the word, preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we are all called to be. We're all called to be preachers. We're to be taking the message of salvation to an entire lost and dying world. Now, now, what's interesting, what Peter says before we leave this text tonight, Peter says, in verse 15 again of chapter number 3, that we are to be ready to give an answer, a reason, if you will, to those who ask us. Amen. We're to live in such a way to where when certain people that we live around, they see that there's a distinction in the way we live. There seems to be a hope, a confidence, an expectancy, a peace, if you will, that accompanies our lifestyle as, uh, as folks become increasingly aware of that kind of lifestyle that we live, that they may question us and say, uh, they may say, Brother John Love, why do you live like that? Why, what's different? You don't seem to, you don't seem to be threatened by, uh, by, by what everyone is saying. And so we're to be ready to give an answer. But I, I, I would ask us this tonight, that we are, or not ask, but I, I would say this tonight to us, that, that we're to do more than be ready to give an answer. We're, we're to do more than, than sit around and wait for someone to ask us a question. We're, we're to do more than to just uh, participate in friendship evangelism and, and trying to live an honest life. That's wonderful and that's great. And I, I, I put prime and promote that. And you ought to live differently. And I, I, I hope you live in a, in a way that's provocative in the sense that, that folks see something different in your life and they become inquisitive about all of those things. And that's, that's absolutely wonderful. But as the children of God, we are called to bring the message of salvation to where they're at we're not called to come to church and sit down on the pew and wait for some poor low sinner to come into our midst and say oh please tell me how to be saved uh, that doesn't happen very often uh, people you know uh, don't, don't, don't come up to us by the droves and say sirs what must I do to be saved not many jailhouses being broken up by earthquakes and the soldiers staying or the prisoners staying put until, the, until the, the prison guard comes in and sees what God's done. We're not necessarily living in that time period anymore. So our message is a message of proactiveness. It is a message that compels us to leave this place and go out yonder and preach. Preach the message of salvation. Mark 16, 15 has not been suspended just because of the days that we live in. Just because there's a there's restrictions on social gatherings just because you, you can't go everywhere and do everything that you used not to do in a public socialistic kind of sense does not mean that God has rescinded his orders for the church of the living God. We are still called to witness. We are still called to preach, to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. I'll be honest with you, church, I've been appalled by the apathy of the professing church as we moved into 2021, I, like the government mandates whether or not we pass out gospel tracts or not. I'm tired of, uh, I'm tired of, uh, uh, of living uh, with, uh, with any kind of a fear looming over me what somebody's going to think about me if I try to pass out a gospel tract to someone, amen? Or if I try to share my faith with someone. And by the way, by the way, it's really an illegitimate fear. Uh, me and Brother Mason went back out this past week and, and, uh, and uh, no one, no one at all that we spoke to uh, was, uh, was standoffish from us just because uh, we were trying to witness to them. In fact, we carried on conversations with individuals. There was a couple of them that, you know, they had the half ninja mask on, say amen. And, uh, you know, everything was fine. They, didn't, they, they weren't put off by it. Listen, this is what we're called to do. Yeah. We're not called to sit idly by until the government says it's okay for you guys to go back to work. I didn't give those orders from the government. Amen. 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 We're not talking about being anarchist here. We're not talking about rebelling against the powers that be, but we're, we're talking about that we must obey God rather than men inside of our life. And so we are to be preachers. In fact, there should even be more passion and drive and concern in our voice than there ever has been before. Now, I mean, let's learn something inside the scriptures. Um, it's very amazing. We learn something from the devil. You ever think you could learn anything from the devil? We learned something very important from the devil. If you were to turn over, you don't have to do that tonight, but over in Revelation chapter 12, and I believe it is verse number 12 that we learned something from the devil. The Bible says that the devil knows that he has but a short while. And so in knowing that he has but a short while, do you know what the Bible says? He begins ramping up his agenda. 
He begins working with more effort, with more, with more energy and passion and power, if you will. He starts wrapping up everything that he's got going on because he knows he has but a short amount of time. But could we not question tonight, then, how much, with how much more intensity and more passion should we preach the gospel, knowing that our time is almost up, knowing that, uh, that things are looking more towards the coming of Christ than they ever have, knowing that, that time is very short, that a person only has so long to live their life. And listen, we are called, we are called by God himself to stand in between that person and an eternity in the charred walls of the damned. With how much more intensity then should we take to the mission field? How much more intensity should we take tomorrow morning as we go back to work with gospel tracks and as we go to the gas station, as we go to the restaurant and to the place of business? Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you handed someone a gospel track? When's the last time you, uh, you told someone the gospel message? When's the last time that you pled with some poor little sinner to come give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ? I wonder tonight, do we plan to stand before our master with not even one soul reclaimed for his glory? I mean, when's the, when, when's the last person that you actually led to Christ? Have you ever, as a professing believer, ever led one single soul to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Someone says, oh, no, I, I didn't know I could do that. Yes, you can do that. In fact, you are called to do that. And the Bible says, uh, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Isn't that amazing? That's something that you and I get to participate in on planet Earth. And let me ask you this question. What's the one thing that saved sinners can do on planet earth that we can't do in heaven? You know what it is? Win lost people to Christ. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. If, uh, if all there was to being a Christian was uh, singing praises to God, when you get saved, God could zap you out of here and you could do that in heaven, right? If, uh, if all there was, was was giving God glory and honor and praise and casting our crowns before His feet, if all there was was to sit down beside a crystal river, crystal uh, a stream inside of heaven and, and gaze upon the one uh, that's sitting upon a throne with a rainbow round about His throne, if that's all there was, we could get saved and God could just, whoop, you know, get us out of here at breakneck speed. <laughs> But that's not all there is to it. You and I are called to win the lost. That's the medium God has chosen to have people come to faith in Christ. A good question for us to ask ourselves is what in the world do we plan on saying to God on the day of judgment? In regards to our evangelism. In regards to our supposed to be preaching. What are we going to say? When we stand there and we haven't done so much as to win one person to faith in Christ. What what, what are we going to say? Well, I gave to missionaries? Like that negated the side of our personal responsibility? Or what are we going to say? I prayed for the evangelist? Or I tried and I I failed? (laughs) Sorry? What what is it? That that we took our pound and we hid it in the earth because we feared (laughs) the repercussions of trying and failing? What is it? You know, um, it's really absurd when you stop and think about it. We are to be at peace. We are to be preachers. Number three tonight, we are to be patient. We are to be patient. And take your Bibles one more time with me tonight. Last passage, back to Luke's gospel, a couple chapters earlier tonight. Luke chapter number 19. Luke chapter number 19. Jesus begins a, a verse earlier to, uh, to give a certain parable, a, a parable about ten servants who were delivered ten pounds, and they were, verse number 13, to occupy till the master return. Occupy till I come. Here's, here's the master, the one over it all who calls those who are placed into positions of service. And he takes 10 pounds and delivers to those 10 servants. And he leaves them with one command. Occupy till I come. The word occupy is a very interesting word, very operative word inside of this parable. It means to busy oneself. It means simply to stay busy. 
the concept given throughout this parable is to stay at the task delivered in spite of the adverse conditions, which is the very definition of patience. In fact, if you'd read through verse number 14, the citizens of that country where those servants were delivered 10 pounds and told to occupy till the master returned, the citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. They hated the master, didn't want any of his business, any of his uh, lordship in their life. And so it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. In other words, did you do what I left you to do? Did you carry on my work in my absence? And the idea of the parable is that when society, according to verse number 14, loses their ever-loving mind, you do what you are told to, even though they're not behaving the way that they should behave. We occupy till he comes. We exercise patience. Again, there's no orders that have been rescinded. And Jesus has told us to be about his father's business to carry on the work that he started. In fact, John 14, he said, in fact, you're not just going to do the works that I do, but you're going to do greater works than these because I go to my father. You're going to carry on the work that I started. A very interesting thing here inside of this story is that the only servant that did not do as he should didn't do so because of fear. <laughs> Verse 21, for I feared thee. Fear was the motivation behind his disobedience. The master said, occupy. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what I have told you to do. And the one man says, um, I can't because I'm scared. I'm fearful. Isn't that interesting? Fear paralyzed him. It, it motivated his disobedience. He was scared to follow through in obedience to the commands of his master. Tonight, church... If you and I are not careful, we will allow fear to paralyze us into hiding the pound of responsibility that's been entrusted to us. We'll allow fear of, um, of a virus, a fear of uh, racial and social tensions, a fear of uh, political venues, a fear of whatever there is. Fear, fear is very gripping. The fear of man, the Bible says, bringeth a snare. There's a trap associated with fear. Fear literally will paralyze us into, into disobeying what we know we are supposed to do. But here's the idea, church. There's supposed to be no fear associated with our lives. What, 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 what do we fear? I, I will not fear what man can do unto me. What man is there? What, what, what entity is there that offers us fear? What could separate me from the love of God? That would be the large fear. That would be the looming fear. Is there something that could separate me from God's love? And so Paul looked for it. I could, uh, could it be found in nakedness? In peril? In sword? Uh, could it be found in, uh, in the heights or in the depths? Could it be found uh, anywhere in things present and things to come? Was there any other creature that, that such a fear could be realized? And Paul said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Huh. You ever thought about that? We're more than conquerors? Huh. How, do you, how do you become something more than a conqueror? Huh. A conqueror is the person that defeats everything. He's one. He's not just a victor. He is a conqueror. There's no one greater than the conqueror. There's nothing left to be more accomplished than to conquer. And yet God says in His holy word that you and I are more than conquerors. Let's go out, church. Let's go out and live lives of peacefulness. Let's, let's show the world what true resolve and confidence looks like. Let's go out and preach the message of salvation and let's have a patience about us to where we are constantly doing what God has called us to do. Listen, He hasn't called us to live God in Christ Jesus Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. He's called us to be faithful, to serve Him every second of every day of our lives. And God help us to do just that. Let's stand tonight for prayer.